At number 10, we have Forex trading. There is no question that currency exchange is permissible in Islam as long as there is no interest charges added both ways and that the exchanger has a valid reason to anticipate a probable profit based upon any analysis that they've done rather than just relying on strictly gambling. It's reported that the Prophet Muhammad in the Hadith said these words, gold for gold, silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, dates for dates, salt for salt, like for like, same for same, hand to hand. If the types are different, then sell however you like, so long as it is hand to hand. At number nine, we have the halal thing of marrying up to four women in Islam. Traditional Sunni and Shia Islamic marital jurisprudence allow Muslim men to be married to multiple women, which is a practice known as polygyny and polygamy. And this total is up to having four of these partners at a time. Why does Islam allow men to marry four wives? What is the wisdom behind it? Why? There are certain rules that need to be applied for this to happen, but it is still considered halal. In the Quran Surah 4 verses 3, it says the following, And if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of other women, two or three or four. But if you fear that you will not be just, then marry only one or those your right hand possesses. That is more suitable that you may not incline to injustice. Number one, Islam was not the first religion who came up with the idea of having more than one wife. All these great messages of the prophets of Allah, they had more than one wife. They said for every 16 girls, there's a one boy that is born. Islam says no. These women, they have rights to be loved, to be wives, to have children, and so on. And now that kind of leads us into number eight, and that is marrying a non-Muslim. Islamic marriage rules between Muslim men and non-Muslim women are regulated by Islamic principles. There are some restrictions though to whom a Muslim can marry, specifically a Muslim man. According to the Quran, Surah 5 verses 5, it says this. This day, all good foods have been made lawful, and the food of those who were given the scripture is lawful for you and your your food is lawful for them. And lawful in marriage are chaste women from among the believers and chaste women from among those who were given the scripture before you. When you have given them their due compensation, desiring chastity, not unlawful sexual intercourse or taking secret lovers. And whoever denies the faith, his work has become worthless and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. Partying comes in at number seven. It is okay to have parties. In Islam, having a good time and relationships with relatives and friends it's actually an obligation even if that relative isn't a Muslim so therefore having gatherings with friends and families and parties and all of that it's actually recommended as long as you keep in mind that the certain gatherings should not have any sort of gossip or you know things that humiliate other people or the use of bad words or other things that are prohibited in Islam let's talk about beautifying for your husband or wife next both men and women are at certain times required to appear in the way that looks pleasant for their life partner, especially when they're alone in their private moments. It is considered to be a great merit for a woman to put on her makeup, wear jewelry and perfume to really charm and please her husband. And it's also a great merit for a man to keep himself well-groomed, well-dressed and all of that in a way to gratify his wife. But the Quran does put some guidelines to this and that is found in Surah 24 verses 31. And that says, and tell the believing women to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts and not expose their adornment except that which necessarily appears thereof and to wrap a portion of their head covers over their chest and do not expose their adornment except to their husbands. Then the Quran does go on to list certain close relatives who a woman can be seen beautified in the presence of. Next up at number five, we're gonna look at traveling and camping. Now the Prophet Muhammad has been recorded to have said these words, travel so that you stay fine and healthy. So going out in nature and parks and camping grounds, even traveling far distances in other cities and spending time overnight in nature actually can really help change your mood. There's a lot of lessons that you can learn out in nature as well as it can help strengthen a believer's relationship with God. Number four, let's look at owning pets. So according to Islam, 
Human beings are allowed to use animals, but only if the rights of the animal is 100% fully respected. The owner of an animal must do everything to benefit the animal. But some people believe that the animal that is kept should never, ever, ever be a dog because Islam does forbid keeping dogs except guard dogs and hunting dogs. Now, in the Hadith narrated by Abu Huraya, it says this. Whoever keeps a dog that is not a dog for hunting, herding, livestock, or farming, two kirats will will be deducted from his reward each day. Dad Singh comes in next at number three. Now this is a little bit of a sensitive one because there's quite a bit of different opinions, but it's said that there is no problem in dancing in itself. However, if the dancing does include some sort of sexually provocative actions, that is forbidden. And it doesn't make any difference to what the type of music is that a person is dancing to. So generally speaking, if dancing is done in a sexually provocative way that can lead to committing other forbidden acts or involves having a bad effect over somebody then it is forbidden but generally speaking outside of that dancing is allowed in Islam. We're almost at the end of this episode we got two more to go and number two we have divorcing up to three times. So when marital harmony cannot be achieved at all by the couple the Quran does allow and even advises the spouses to bring the marriage to a full end. In the Quran it says this and if he has divorced her for the third time Time, then she is not lawful to him afterward until after she marries a husband other than him. And if the latter husband divorces her or dies, there is no blame upon the woman and her former husband for returning to each other if they think that they can keep within the limits of Allah. These are the limits of Allah which he makes clear to the people who know. And that is taken specifically from the Quran Surah 2 verses 230. We made it to number one, the halal Thing that we're going to end off this episode with is praying in other worship houses. So not many people know this. Well, when I say not many people, I'm talking about people that aren't necessarily familiar with the religion of Islam. But did you know that Muslims can pray anywhere? Although it is recommended to pray with others in a mosque, but it is permissible to pray in the house of worship for Christians, for example, or anyone else who does not follow the religion of Islam because the general meaning of the words of the Prophet Muhammad is this. The earth has been made for a place of prostration and a means of purification. So wherever a man of my ummah is when the time for prayer comes, let him pray. And that's in the hadith narrated by al-Bukhari number 323. So let's start off with halal thing number 10 and that is exempt from Fasting. This is something that is permissible. Fasting during the month of Ramadan is mandatory for all healthy adult Muslims. However, children who have not reached the age of puberty, as well as the elderly folk and those who are physically or mentally incapable of fasting, as well as pregnant women and breastfeeding mothers, and also even travelers are permitted not to fast. And this is supported in the Quran, Surah 2 verses 185 that says, The month of Ramadan is that in which was revealed the Quran, a guidance for the people and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So whoever cites the new moon of the month, let him fast. And whoever is ill or on a journey, then an equal number of other days. Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you hardship and wants for you to complete the period and to glorify Allah for that to which he has guided you and perhaps you will be grateful. Number nine has to do with praying. Did you know it is permissible for the travelers to shorten the four rakat salat to two rakats? And by the way, a rakat is a single instance of movement and supplication that's performed by Muslims during prayer. Also what's permissible is joining the durr, which is the noon prayer together with the asr, which is the afternoon prayer. And also the maghrib, which the sunset prayer together with the Isha, which is the night prayer. This is because in the Quran, it says this in Surah 4 verses 101. And when you travel throughout the land, there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer, especially if you fear that those who disbelieve may disrupt or attack you. Indeed, the disbelievers are ever to you a clear enemy. Next thing we're going to look at is seeking omens. This point has been explained by Ibn al-Qayyim. And he said in the hadith, 
Allah has prohibited seeking omens by drawing lots but has provided the alternative of istikhara. Islam teaches that if the Muslim faces a problem, he should consult with others and seek guidance from Allah. The meaning of istikhara is to ask guidance from Allah in making a choice between two conflicting decisions. For this, there is a salat and a dua, which is a supplication for seeking Allah's guidance. So again, it is permissible if the omen that you're seeking is seeking guidance from others and also guidance from Allah. But like we mentioned in our Haram series, you can't go to people like witch doctors and psychics, things like that, no. Next up, let's talk about food. Islam is not oblivious to the pressures of life. It permits Muslims in need to eat a prohibited food in certain quantities that are enough to save their life. And the Quran, Surah 2 verses 173, it speaks about this and it says, He has only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. But whoever is forced by necessity, neither desiring it nor nor transgressing its limit, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Let's also look at dead animals. There is some permissibility when it comes to them. Islamic law has exempted fish and whales and other sea creatures from the category of dead animals. When the Prophet Muhammad was asked about the sea, he replied, its water is pure and its dead are halal. Now in the Quran, Surah 5 verses 96, it says, lawful to you is game from the sea and its food as provision for you and the travelers, but forbidden to you is game from the land as long as you are in the state of Ihram. And fear Allah to whom you will be gathered. All right, so for number five, we talked about dead animals, but let's get a little bit further. There's permissibility when it comes to using dead animals. The prohibition concerning the dead animal is limited to the eating of its flesh. One can, in fact, make use of its skin, its horns, bones, and hairs. And when it comes to this, Ibn Abbas narrated this in the Hadith. The freed maidservant of the Prophet's wife, Maymuna, was given a sheep and it died. The prophet passed by its carcass and said, Why did you not take its skin to be tanned and use it? They replied, But it is dead. The prophet said, What is prohibited is eating it. Hunting is also permissible, but there are some guidelines to it. Islam teaches that a hunter should not just hunt for fun, like taking the life of animal without intending to eat it or otherwise benefit from it. And the prophet Muhammad is reported to have said this in the Hadith. If someone kills a sparrow for sport, the sparrow Pharaoh will cry out on the day of judgment. Oh Lord, that person killed me in vain. He did not kill me for any useful purpose. Again, according to the words of the Prophet Muhammad in the Hadith, it says, whoever killed a sparrow or anything bigger than that without a just cause, Allah will hold him accountable on the day of judgment. The listeners asked, O Messenger of Allah, what is a just cause? He replied that he kill it to eat, not to simply chop off its head and then throw it away. Next up at number three, let's look at silk and gold. So beautification is permitted in Islam and the Quran has this to say, who has forbidden the adornment of Allah which he has produced for his servants and the good lawful things of provision? Say they are for those who believe during the worldly life but exclusively for them on the day of resurrection. Thus do we detail the verses for the people who know. And that's taken from Surah 7 verses 32. Islam has however prohibited two kinds of adornment for men while also permitting them to women. And these are the use of gold and gold ornaments, as well as the second is clothing made of pure silk. In the Hadith, it's reported that the Prophet took some silk in his right hand and some gold in his left, declaring, these two are haram for the males among my followers. It's also very halal to live luxuriously. Muslims are free to adorn their house with various kinds of flowers and fabrics and other permitted objects. Muslims are also free to desire beauty in their home as well as elegance in their clothing and appearance. In the Hadith, it's recorded that the Prophet Muhammad said these words, anyone who has an atom of pride in his heart will not enter the garden. A man then asked, what about the one who likes to wear a handsome robe and good shoes? The Prophet replied, surely Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. So it's permitted to definitely look presentable and beautify your home, beautify 
by your dress and everything, but just as long as it doesn't lead to vanity, where now you put yourself above others and put other people down because of your appearance and all the good luxurious things that you have. And finally, at number one, we have toys. This is something that I wondered about too, but toys such as dolls in the form of humans and animals, they fall in the permissible category. In the Hadith narrated by the Prophet's wife Aisha, this is what it says. I used to play with dolls in the house of the Messenger of Allah and my friends would come over to play with me. They would hide when they saw the Messenger of Allah approaching, but he was in fact very happy to see them with me and so we played together. In another Hadith, Aisha also reported, one day the Messenger of Allah asked me, what are these? My dolls, I replied. What is this in the middle? He asked. A horse, I replied. And what are these things on it? He asked. Wings, I said. A horse with wings? He asked. Have not you heard that Solomon, the son of David, had horses with wings? I said. Thereupon, the messenger of Allah laughed so heartily that I could see his molars. So the Hadith also records the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, but also the silent testimonies. So because these things weren't condemned, Muslims believe that they are permissible. First thing we're going to talk about at number 10 is begging. If someone is under the pressure of need, like real need, and if they feel really forced to ask for financial help from the government or another individual, then that person is completely blameless. As a matter of fact, it's recorded that the Prophet Muhammad said these words, begging is similar to scratching the flesh off your face. So if someone wants to save his face, he shall avoid it, except for asking from the ruler or asking in case of dying need. Number nine is earning through agriculture. This is something that's really, really, really encouraged in Islam. In the Quran, while referring to his bounties as well as favors to humans, there's a passage that mentions Allah's principles required for the pursuit of agriculture. Muslims believe that God has spread out the earth and made it very suitable to be fertile for cultivation and production, and that this is a bounty to human beings which they ought to recall and to be thankful for. Over in the Quran, Surah 71, verses 19 to 20, it says, And Allah has made for you the earth an expanse, that you may follow therein roads of passage. Painting comes in at number eight. This relates to a question that many people have. So just like drawing, painting, or photography, they're either prohibited or disapproved, depending on what comes closest to the spirit of Islamic law. Of course, their subject matter shouldn't be anything sexually provocative, but also these things shouldn't contain someone that is considered sacred, like the prophets, for example. Next up at number seven, we have trade. The Prophet Muhammad, by his words and deeds, he laid out the rules for trade, encouraging Muslims to engage in it. Among some of these sayings are as follows. An honest and trustworthy merchant will be with the martyrs on the day of resurrection. Also, Islam does provide a huge opportunity for international trade every single year. Like the annual Hajj season brings together at one place millions of different Muslims from all around the world. And over in the Quran, Surah 22 verses 27 to 28, it says, and proclaim to the people the Hajj pilgrimage. They will come to you on foot and on every lean camel. They will come from every distant pass that they may witness benefits for themselves and mention the name of Allah on known days over what he has provided for them of sacrificial animals. So eat of them and feed the miserable and poor. Next up, we're looking at employment at number six. Muslims, they are free to seek employment in all manner of different offices, offices of government and different organizations, as well as working for individuals and entrepreneurs, just as long as they're able to fulfill their job duties to a satisfactory level, as well as carry out their Muslim obligations. However, Muslims are not permitted to seek jobs that they are not fit for. If, however, a person knows that there is no one else that is really qualified like them to do a particular job except them, and that if he doesn't take the job, then public interest will be damaged or ruined altogether, then that person should come forward and step up and take on that role. The Quran actually tells the story of the Prophet Joseph, where Joseph tells the ruler this, 
Joseph said, appoint me over the storehouse of the land. Indeed, I will be a knowing guardian. And that's taken from Surah 12 verses 55. So this is something that Muslims look to as an example of this. So for number five, we're talking about looking at a man and woman. Now a woman may look at a man's body apart from his awra or private parts, which is from the navel to the knee, as long as her looking at him doesn't contain any kind of lust. The Prophet let Aisha watch the Abyssinians while they were engaging in spare play in the courtyard of the Prophet's mosque. She watched their performance until she had enough and she ended off her day going to sleep. And similarly, a man is permitted to look at a woman's face and hands since they are not her private parts. Just as long as this looking doesn't contain any lust as well as there's no form of temptation that's taking over him. Next up, kind of similar to number Five, let's talk about public baths. In consideration of Islam's concerns for women covering up their private parts and not revealing themselves to the public, it is proper to cover and the Prophet did warn Muslim women against entering public baths and even disrobing in front of other women. An exception to this though is made for women who suffer from some kind of illness so that they have to take a bath that would be beneficial for them and also for women that have given birth following childbirth, they say warm baths are very, very, very good, or even giving birth in a warm bath. And this is referenced in the Hadith by Abdullah ibn Amr, who narrated that the Prophet Muhammad said, concerning public baths, that men must not enter them without a lower garment. Women are not to enter them except when sick or after childbirth. Another touchy topic, no pun intended, is masturbation. Now, the majority of scholars consider this completely haram, and Imam Malik bases his judgment on this verse. And they who guard their private parts except from their wives or those their right hand possesses, for indeed they will not be blamed. But whoever seeks beyond that, then those are the transgressors. And that's taken from Surah 23 verses 5 to 7. He argues that the person masturbating is someone who craves something beyond that. However, according to the Han Hanbali school of thought, Hanbali jurists, they permit masturbation under two conditions only. And that is for the fear of committing fornication or adultery. And the second is not having the means to marry. All right, what about seeing the one that you want to marry? In Islam, it is permissible for Muslim men to see the woman to whom he intends to propose marriage before taking all the further steps so that he can enter the marriage knowing what lies ahead of him. Otherwise, if he has not seen her before the marriage, he may not find her looks to be of his liking and may regret marrying her. al mughira ibn Shubha said this, I asked for a woman in marriage and Allah's messenger asked me whether I had looked at her. When I replied that I had not, he said, then look at her for it may produce love between you. I went to her parents and informed them of the Prophet's advice. They seemed to disprove of the idea. Their daughter heard the conversation from her room and said, if the Prophet has told you to look at me, then look. I looked at her and subsequently I married her. We're gonna end off this video talking about female consent. It is a girl's right to make the decision concerning her marriage and her father or her guardian is not permitted at all to override any of her wishes. Now in the Hadith, it's recorded that the Prophet Muhammad said these words, a woman who has been previously married has more right concerning her person than her guardian and a virgin's consent must be asked about herself her consent being her silence. Ibn Majah also reported this in the Hadith. A girl came to the Prophet and informed him that her father had married her to her cousin against her wishes, whereupon the Prophet allowed her to exercise her choice. She then said, I reconciled to what my father did, but I wanted to make it known to women that fathers have no say in this matter. And that is where we're gonna end off this episode. This was a look at 10 surprisingly halal things in Islam. So I really hope you liked this one as well. As always, leave your thoughts and comments down below. Other than that, guys, that is it for me. I'm gonna get out of here. So stay awesome, stay educated, and I'm gonna see you next time in another video. Later.